Well, I mean, so much I want to get to. Um, I want to talk about some of the big stories in the news. But mm -hmm. first up, can we just talk about just some basics of the Tory leadership contest? Sure. Which, let's be honest, has not set the world alight, has it not? People have not been very focused on it, given that you are in opposition. Mm. Um, first question to you, why do you want to be leader of the Conservative Party and why do you think you're the best candidate? I think that our party is at a crossroads. We are the most successful political party in the history of Western democracy. But there is no guarantee that we're still going to be here next time. Those of us who are MPs now, all of us who are party members... I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Can I ask you? I think your hair is on your mic and I think oh, it's... Right. Uh, yeah, could I ask... Yeah, so I do apologise. <laughs> just, just an easy listen for all of Is that better? Thank you very much indeed. Apologies to interrupt. And we need to make sure that... Um, we've got a Conservative Party to hand over to the next generation. So this is about fixing ourselves before going to the country and saying, oh, why don't you give us another go? Here are some new policies. Nobody trusts us right now because they don't think we delivered last time. So we they need don't to, think um, you did or you didn't? Uh, we did do some things, not everything. We were often talking right and governing left, but that doesn't mean we didn't do anything. We actually did a lot. So I'm not here to uh, trash the last 14 years. I am standing to show what we did well, what we didn't do well, about what the future looks like. OK, so what did you do well? Well, just look at the last few years. Can you imagine if Jeremy Corbyn had won the 2019 election and was in charge during COVID? That was an extremely difficult time for the whole country. Uh, look at what we did with the vaccine task force, for example. You look at the inheritance we had in 2010. We managed the economy well. If we hadn't, we would not have had the money to spend during COVID. You look at what we did with education, shot up the, um, the rankings internationally in England, whereas where Conservatives weren't in control in Scotland and Wales, look what happened there. And yet, if you look at uh, public services as they are now, the stuff that the government's so been in charge of, I've been asking ministers for the last couple of years, name me a public service that works. They do work, but they have challenges. And these challenges are not specific to the UK. When I was Trade Secretary, I went all around the world. Every country was dealing with the same things. Ageing population, immigration, cost of living, inflation, post-COVID uh, supply chain issues, what to do about China. Everybody was worried about China. These are not things that are unique to the UK. But what we have got into is a technocratic managerialist rut. We've had too many people who talk but can't do. I am an engineer. I know how to build things, and that's what my platform uh, is about. There's a lot of talk about conservative values. What are conservative values? And a lot of talk, you say you, the, the party has talked right, but mm. government left. So many times I would cheer on an announcement from mm. the government. And Rishi Sunak <laughs> was like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Whether it's on, you know, we'll come on to issues like trans and, and climate and mm. that sort of thing. Oh, they're getting, they're getting sane on this stuff. They're going to do something. And then you wouldn't actually see anything happen. A lot of Conservative Party members feel that they're not right wing. Mm. Uh, certainly not far right, as mm. they have been called. Um, they are simply conservatives, but the Conservative Party has shifted massively to the left, to the extent that it's basically a Lib Dem, Blairite, Labour Party in lots of ways. So tell me, what are, in your view, conservative values? Uh, well, there are very many of them, and they are the things that made this country great. Equality under the law is, uh, is a key one. So not treating different groups uh, differently, making sure that everybody is exactly the same. We don't have tiers and hierarchies of citizens. You look at what's happening, for instance, with sentencing. Look at this um, extraordinary story today about Hugh Edwards. Lots of people are asking, why is it that, that it feels like there are different rules for different groups of people? That's a conservative principle which we have not enforced properly. Another one is personal responsibility. Not believing that the government is there to service you and be a concierge for all your needs. That people actually have to get up and do quite a lot of things for themselves. And if they don't, then they need to understand that there are consequences for that mm -hmm. and there isn't always a permanent safety net. Mm -hmm. I think those are the sorts of principles uh, that we have not really spoken about. We've spoken about policies a lot. We'll cut waiting lists and we'll have more GPs. Those aren't principles. If we start off from what we believe, that's what brings the trust in. OK, I'm going to come back to Hugh Edwards in that sentence mm -hmm. as well. But can I ask you about... Um, winning back power because ultimately the point as you say the conservative is party has long been an election winning machine mm. 
um, did not win, and I think no one expected the Conservatives to win at the last election. People might not have wanted the Labour Party to win, judging by the actual a vote for Labour, but they certainly didn't want you guys to still be in power. Mm. Um, is, it, is it conceivable to you that the Conservatives can win the next general election without winning back those voters who turned to the Reform Party at Nigel Farage, 4.2, I think, 2 or 3 million people? And, and how would you go about winning them back? So we certainly need to win reform voters back. In my constituency, when I was knocking on doors, it was former Conservative voters who were going to reform. So we certainly can't win without winning back the people who we lost um, at this last election. But there is more to being an, uh, a, a party, a winning party, than just being an election winning machine. Mm -hmm. these, these are some of the mistakes that we've made. But we need to find somebody who can win without asking what are we winning for? Because when those people do win, then they don't know what to do and then they don't have a proper agenda, which is what we're seeing with Labour now. You know, I sort of caught glimpses of um, David Lammy's speech. Very, very unserious stuff. We need to ask ourselves what we are winning for. What is the vision? What is the agenda? And that's what I think that we need to talk about. Yeah, OK. Um, can I ask you why so many are saying that although you appear to be the most popular among Tory party members and, and have been for quite some time, um, again, a lot of these polls, people say they're self-selecting uh, uh, and the like, but in nevertheless, poll after poll seems to show that Tory party members want Kemi Badenoch as their next leader. But... You haven't come first in either the first two rounds in the, mem the votes between the 121 Tory MPs. Some claim that you make enemies too often, that you're not good at pulling people together, that you are a bit too uh, so say rough around the edges in terms of your managerial style. Is any of that true? No, no. Those are things that are being put about by those who are competing against me and uh, who don't want me to win. All of the people who worked as ministers uh, with me are, uh, are supporting my campaign. So the people who know me, the people who have worked with me, actually are supporting. Uh, but some of the strengths which members love are often seen as, uh, as weaknesses. Being straight talking, telling people the truth. A lot of people don't like to hear the truth. And I'm somebody who's very straight talking. And I have been in many situations where I've had to say, that's not right, we're not going to do this. Uh, some of the people who I said those things to aren't MPs anymore, but they say things which um, others hear and they become rumors that spread. But the fact of the matter is, I'm the only person who has managed to get Labour to change their policy to our position, which is what I did on extreme gender ideology and self-ID. I have many, many, many achievements showing that I deliver. But people who get stuff done often uh, will step on toes, but I make sure that I do bring people together, otherwise I would never have got any of those things done. Okay. Um, Robert Jenrick, um, he's, uh, been, he's come top of the poll uh, uh, twice now of Tory MPs. Um, with claim, claiming that he's you know, he's basically gunning for the right of the party votes, um, many people saw him as very much centre. Um, you know, on, on the other, the mm. one nation side, a Rishi Sunak uh, supporter. Um, um, is he is he the real deal? Uh, I can't speak for him. He's the one who has to say whether he's the real deal or not. What I will say about myself is that I have been consistent. I haven't had to backtrack on anything I've said before. I haven't had any gaffes where I've had to apologise for things because, uh, you know, I've changed my mind. I'm very consistent because I start with my principles. Principles matter. And if you start with principles and people understand what you're about, then they know what you're getting. Okay. I haven't had to move left or right. right. I'm Kemi. I'm principles, me. values, all very well, and they do matter in politics. Yeah. We need more of them. However, what people are caring about when they're worrying about the cost of living crisis mm. and many other issues is what things you'd actually do mm. if you were in power. Now, you may well be, if you were a leader five years away from power, mm. at least, uh, uh, but people would like to know, what is the biggest defining issue in the next few years in British politics or in the world? What, is, what, is, what are the issues that you think you're going to have to grapple with? So, my diagnosis is that the system is broken. This is why I say we need an engineer to fix it. We've had too many politicians who use words to do everything. Lots of lawyers, lots of journalists. We've got Keir Starmer, a lawyer. David Lammy, another lawyer. Lawyers aren't going to get us out of the mess we're in. We need people who know how to fix things. We have a state that has got too big. We are not producing enough, not enough people are working. We have an aging population and we are still using an administrative system that was built for the 19th, early 20th century. The whole thing needs rewiring, rebooting. Otherwise, you won't get an NHS that works. 
otherwise you won't get trains that run on time you won't have schools that are teaching young children properly all of these things are linked and so i am talking about the thing that links them together mm. which is that our economy is no longer as productive as it used to be we're not making as much money but we still act like we're the richest country in the world we are still relatively very wealthy but we can't pay for the whole world but we're, we're we also not as wealthy gdp per capita we are not as, no. as wealthy no, uh, no, as, not. as we as we think we are uh, certainly that's the case uh, rachel reeves the new chancellor has claimed that there's a 22 billion pound black hole though bizarrely financial times asked them in freedom of information request to uh, to identify the treasury exactly where that money had come from uh, unable to provide their workings which is which is interesting um but she's going to deliver a budget on october the 30th we are told there's going to be a lot of pain we've already seen pain for pensioners who 10 million of whom many of them on the lowest possible incomes mm -hmm. are losing uh, their access to the winter fuel payments 300 pounds a, a, a year um do we need the tory leadership contest shortened um simply to make sure that you're not in place whoever wins on november the second the saturday after the october 30th budget so it's not a failed leader rishi sunak with all due respect to him, but a failed leader uh, responding to the budget uh, but the actual new leader of the party no i don't think that's going to make any difference whatsoever uh i, I call it an inside baseball sort of question rishi sunak has been chancellor of the exchequer and he's been prime minister in terms of what has just happened no one knows more and knows better in terms of responding to Labour's first budget. So I'm uh, perfectly happy with him uh, doing that. I don't think it makes a difference who is standing there. There are going to be many more budgets for the leader of the opposition to look at. What is going to be critical is making sure that we hold Labour to account. We can't vote their budget down. There's not enough of us. Labour has a super majority. Mm -hmm. uh, there's 120 MPs uh, or 21 MPs on the Conservatives, five reform everybody else is left or to the left of Labour. The Liberal Democrats are to the left of Labour. We are the only ones who are going to hold them to account. And I'm very confident that the Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt and the current shadow cabinet uh, will be able to do that. OK, let's talk about the, uh, the business secretary job. You were business secretary. Mm -hmm. One of the announcements we've ha had today is that the government is looking at making it a legal right to, well, not to work from home, to ask your employer to work from home for them to give it serious consideration as a default um, issue. Of course, I mean, that's pretty much already the position. Is it not for any, yes, any companies or, or, or public services where that, that is uh, viable? Although, bearing in mind, most people do jobs that can't be done from home and most of the chattering classes seem to forget this. I don't know if they want their Uber delivery man to, to work from home. I'm not sure how that would work. Um, we're also told that we've got a sick note Britain. We're going to have a 50% increase in the number of people who are of working age, who are not working who are claiming sick leave, either physical or mental health problems. As a former business secretary, uh, what do you make of those stories and what would you do about them? So these were some of the issues which I did look at. And I find it extraordinary that Labour are scraping the policy barrel here to find more ways for people to have flexible working when actually we need to get more people into the workplace. They're not learning, they're not getting the skills uh, at the same rate they used to, and which is one of the challenges of working from home. I'm a fan of working from home when it makes sense, but it shouldn't necessarily be the default. There's so much that doesn't, um, that doesn't work, as you've, just, uh, as you've just described. But what is extraordinary is that Labour have had 14 years is to think about what to do about the economy and all they've got. You guys had 14 years actually in charge. Yes, yes, but it's very, but it's totally different. When you're in charge, you're dealing with day-to-day -day crises, you're fighting fires, and we did do quite a lot of stuff. We brought in lots of flexible working. We brought in shared parental leave, brought in bereavement leave. The fact that they have gone back to the same policy barrel and said, well, we're going to do a little bit more of that shows that they've got no answers. Okay, well, we know that I mean, public services are very much holding back the productivity of this country. Private sector has seen productivity mm -hmm. improve. In companies where working from home doesn't work, we've seen again and again they're, they're rolling back on that and getting Absolutely. people back into the office, which kind of tells you something. We've seen zero productivity growth in 20 years in the public sector. What would you do if you were in charge right now, not a cabinet minister, not a leader of the opposition if you win the job? Um, what would you do to improve public sector productivity? Well, we actually need fewer people in a lot of the public sector. Public sector productivity is also a function of how much the public sector is doing. Yep. Do we really need a new football regulator, for example? Do we really need all of these regulators who actually are not delivering in a way that people want? You look at uh, the problem that we have with sewage, for example, where's the Environment Agency, where is off what? There's so much public sector now that is not delivering. So it is about reform. It is about shrinking the states to focus on delivering services rather than creating more and more regulation. We are 
we are we have got into a bad habit of making more and more laws without being able to enforce anything here's a problem we're going to make a new law somebody doesn't like this here's a new law laws 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 no enforcement and that is part of the reason why productivity is dropping we need to stop making new rules and enforce some of the ones that are already there yeah i would certainly agree with an awful lot of that Let, let's go back to laws because you mentioned you brought up hugh edwards mm. at the beginning of one of your answers earlier um, a lot of people are getting in touch with us on the show about the former bbc presenter no jail time whatsoever and extraordinarily i think a lot of us are very surprised at the fact that he hasn't even got any restrictions on his use of the internet yeah. uh, and on his phone on his home computer no monitoring of that because he's been deemed a low risk even though he was clearly enjoying seeing pictures images of children as young as seven years old being sexually abused I mean most of us you've got kids would go yeah I, I mean would you have him babysit your kids can be made knock I'm guessing you'd think he's probably something of a risk mm -hmm. so what do you make of this idea that someone who has been one of the great and the good is much loved much you know much mm -hmm. trusted and respected man at the BBC being given that sentence apparently quite a typical sentence mm -hmm. for someone at the same time as people who have sent, yes, some very unpleasant, very nasty, some blatantly racist, horrible tweets and Facebook messages post the Southport uh, attacks um, and those and, and at the time of riots being actually sent to prison. Mm -hmm. If I was leader of the opposition, one of the things that I'd be commissioning is a root and branch review of sentencing guidelines. It does feel like there's one law for some groups of people and another for others, or that there are some crimes which are trendy and which uh, more time is spent on. Hate crime uh, laws, or in fact, non-hate crime incidents, yeah. which is one of the most ludicrous things I think. Uh, but again, I think that we it was we never have. stopped. It's, this is, and this is, these are the things that we need to talk were about. Were you arguing Many about us, this? Yes, we were. Cabinet? Yes, we were. Yes, we were. And Not who in cabinet said, no, no, we should definitely allow what, so, this so to continue? What, what tends to happen is that somewhere several years back, a commitment has been made, a promise has been made at the dispatch box. And people who made those promises don't want to go back on it because even that is losing is losing trust. That is not the way to do things. What we need to do is have a debate first and then decide on what the policy should be afterwards. Rather than what we saw people making concessions during the hung parliament where there were lots of um you know, lots of things that we gave to Labour so they would help us pass legislation through. Mm -hmm. Non-hate crime incidents was one of those things which many of us argued uh, over behind the scenes and we were told, oh, don't worry, it'll be fine. Of course, this isn't going to happen. And those things do happen. Okay. We've got to stop that. So a root and branch review. But what is really shocking, in my view, about uh, the Hugh Edward Edwards case is that a serious crime has been committed. There's no such thing as child porn, in my view. Yeah. So, this is sexual abuse that's taking place. And I want a society where paedophiles are going to prison, not just socially shamed. Social shame is not enough. I have three children. They are under the age of 12. I cannot imagine anything like that happening to them. And it's up to people like us to make sure that children all across our country and the world are protected. Uh, just got a, got a couple more questions I want to ask you very briefly. Uh, David Lammy was saying the Foreign Secretary currently right now giving a speech saying climate action will be central to the Foreign Office. He's uh, forming a new climate coalition internationally. He says this is a bigger threat uh, to, the, to, the, to the world uh, than threats of autocratic leaders like uh, Vladimir Putin or terrorism. Um, do you agree with him or is that a completely dark thing? He is not thing a serious say? man. He is not a serious man by any stretch of the imagination. And this goes back to his you know, appearance on Mastermind where he said Henry VII succeeded Henry VIII. This is who is representing us on, on the world stage. What is our biggest challenge now? It is a coalition of authoritarian states that are acting and collaborating against Western interests, including the UK's interests. That is the biggest challenge. Of course, climate change is a challenge, but it's not him having a group of people uh, sitting in a meeting that's going to fix that. Well, that's what we've been doing for the last 10, 15 years. He's talking about COP26. Many of the commitments that were made there, other countries aren't following through. Why are they not following through? Simply saying we're going to do this without having a plan is silly. The plan that we put in place ended up enriching China and is deindustrializing the UK. As business secretary, these were one of some of the things that I worked very hard to try and solve. It's very virtually impossible to solve with the targets and commitments that we've made. We need to look at all of this 
from uh, you would drop the net zero one. targets and put prioritize economic growth well economic without economic it's growth we're not, going to hit, we're not going to hit net okay. zero without without economic growth we're not okay. going to hit net zero just finally i want to ask you uh, you've been a cabinet minister on a good salary you, you, you've you're an engineer on a good salary you've you, you've got mp now um, um did you buy your own frock i never had i never had um anyone buying clothes for me i had lots of offers but I didn't. But you had the, offers as a, as a front bencher. Some, yes, people, some, you know, designers who who gets in touch. Um, no, no, I, I won't name any names. But now, now certainly now, as a backbencher, I would take those offers. But the key thing, you would. Is, yes, I would. I, I'll give you an example. I had five white tie state dinners um, to attend. My husband had to buy a two thousand pound suit. Uh, hiring them was about four hundred pounds each time. So there are lots of things which, if you are in those senior positions, it costs more. Yeah. Which um, a backbench salary. And you're repre you're, yes. His argument and you're is you're representing, representing the government. Yes, but. It should be for your job. People should know when. You shouldn't forget to declare them. I think th there's more of a reason for the politician, especially female politicians, than men. Um, spouses, there's less of a reason. But it has to be done. It has to be done properly. Do you think that Keir Starmer, though, has been hypocritical when he's criticised Carrie That's, Johnson and Boris Johnson, yes. when at the same time my his issue, wife's had five grand's worth of uh, My of issue with him is not the is not the clothes. It's that when uh, Boris and Carrie were having public property decorated. Mm -hmm. They were pilloried and attacked. These were some of the things which they I also took. Them you for. know, a villa holiday. I mean, I mean, oh, yes, but but do you understand why? Why an awful? I understand the argument mm. about you have to have some clothes for state yes. state occasions. I think a lot of people would understand yes. that. Vast so when I say that, because I've seen them at those occasions before. Vast majority of people before. are, are mm. you know, on on average incomes mm. and, and you know, pensioners who are about to lose, you know, or just lost their their winter fuel Absolutely. payments, wondering how on earth people on salaries which are vastly more than the average person has say they need to have someone buy their dresses for them. Do you know who does get some of their uh, clothes paid for? Civil servants. When they do uh, a lot of these events and so on, they are able to claim things which um, which politicians can't. So I think should there be an allowance? Should there be a kind of a dress, a suit, a frock allowance for politicians? I, I I actually think that anything that doesn't cost the taxpayer money is good. If other people in the private sector want to do that, that's fine. But why but do they want be... to do that? What do they want in return? Um, I don't think they do want things in. Well, certainly the people who offer me stuff didn't want anything in return. Okay. They just thought that you'd be a good clothes horse. But the hypocrisy is the issue, and that's what. Okay. I think has come unstuck for Keir Starmer. Right. We'll have to leave yes. it there. Yes. Kemi Bader not Tory a leadership candidate, former business secretary, in a very nice orange dress that she paid for herself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for joining us.